Steve Phillips was a violent alcoholic and drug addict. Steve and Melissa Phillips lived in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and had a child on March 17, 1984. His name was Joshua Phillips. Joshua lived under strict rules and was constantly in fear of his father. For example, he couldn't have friends around when his father wasn't home. For some reason, Steve especially disliked young girls. Joshua was a quiet and friendly kid and rarely, if ever, got into any trouble at school. On the 3rd of November, 1998, according to Joshua's own account, he was at home alone when his friend Maddie Clifton came to his house wanting to play baseball. Despite the rules of his house, he agreed. At some point, Joshua accidentally hit the baseball into her eye. She was bleeding, crying, and screaming. Joshua began to spiral into blind panic. His father would be home soon, and if he couldn't get her to stop crying, he was terrified to think of what his father would do to him when he found out she was even here. He tried in vain to get her to calm down. When that failed, he dragged her into his house, some of her clothing being pulled off in the process. And when he still couldn't get her to be quiet, he hit her with a baseball bat until she stopped screaming. He stashed her under the base of his waterbed and went out to greet Steve. They talked for a while before Joshua went to his bed. She was still alive, moaning under his bed when he found her. In too deep, he cut her throat and stabbed her in the chest seven times with his trusty Leatherman. She was reported missing at 5 p.m. that day, and it would be nearly a week before she would be found. During that time, Joshua was one of the most active volunteers in the search for this victim. He later said he was in a fantasy world where nothing happened. That was my defense mechanism for everything when I was a kid. I never made the decision to ignore it. I just did. Joshua was in the eye of the storm, and soon it would come to an end. On November 10th, Joshua's mother went into her son's room to clean and noticed a wet spot on the floor. She thought there may have been a leak in his waterbed, so she pulled it out to look for it and found the dark secret hiding underneath. She left to report it to the police immediately, and her son was arrested later that day. He confessed within hours. Joshua's trial was moved from Duval County, Florida to Polk County over publicity concerns, and Joshua was tried as an adult. Seemingly, some of the evidence didn't line up with the above version of events. For instance, prosecution pointed out that there wasn't any dirt on Clifton's body like would be expected if the clothes came off as she was being dragged inside. Furthermore, there wasn't any blood found in the backyard or on the baseball Joshua claimed to have hit her with. Of course, all of these could likely have been easily explained by Joshua had he been allowed to testify, or had his lawyer, Richard D. Nicholas, talked to him about the case rather than just played chess with him or even called a single witness to defense. He was planning on winning with a Hail Mary using the closing arguments, in which he stated that the crime was an act that began as an accident and deteriorated through the panic that bordered on madness. Meanwhile, the prosecutors used the fact that he carried on with his victim under the bed to argue that he was cold and they were trying to claim the murder was sexually motivated. However, there wasn't really any good evidence for it, and the autopsy didn't show any signs of sexual assault. Furthermore, it was nearly a week after the murder before the body was found. If Joshua had left blood all over the scene for a full week, he would have been found out much sooner, so it makes sense that there wouldn't be any in the backyard. He would have cleaned it. It's also possible the clothes got caught on the window frame, which would explain the lack of dirt. It is for these reasons that it seems most likely his version of events was more or less true. The trial only lasted two days as a result of the defense putting up no defense whatsoever. It only took jurors two hours to convict Joshua of first-degree murder. 
He was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. The only reason he was spared the death penalty was that at the time he was under 16. Joshua has since acquired a new lawyer, Thomas Fallis, who has stated that if Joshua had made a proper defense, jurors may have convicted him of a lesser charge and thus gotten a shorter sentence. As a result, they have filed multiple appeals to try and change the sentencing. Joshua got his GED in prison and then went on to take college classes by correspondence. He now works as a paralegal in prison, helping others file their appeals. He also tutors other inmates. He plays guitar and participates in a Christian prison ministry. He practices Zazen meditation and yoga, and says that these have taught him how to almost completely put himself in someone else's shoes, and that they taught him to be a better person. He said he's grown a lot and can't imagine hurting anyone now. He's grown up in prison, and counterintuitively, this seems to have softened him rather than hardened him. He fights back tears whenever he talks about Maddie and her family. He said that he thinks about her all the time. For example, when he starts feeling sorry for himself, I start thinking, man, it sucks I missed out on this and that. And as soon as I get there, I think, what did she miss out on? He's one of Florida's youngest inmates and was lucky enough to find a group of older inmates that showed him the ropes and showed him how to stay out of trouble. Prison officials have also protected him by limiting his time in the yard and housing him in open barracks instead of a cell. In 2008, he decided not to write a letter of apologies to the victims left behind as they wouldn't be able to see his sincerity through the written word. Maddie's sister would like to talk to him but Clifton's mother understandably wants nothing to do with him. She believes that his sentence was entirely appropriate, saying he shouldn't be cut a deal just because he was only 14 at the time. He's partially thankful for the way things turned out. Sure, if he was tried as a juvenile, he'd already be free. However, he feels he wouldn't be nearly as rehabilitated and would have been more easily manipulated in juvenile detention it might have gotten a lot worse for him. Back when he was 16, he had been in prison for two years. He left the chow hall one day and saw a line of old inmates at the pill line. I was like, wow, that's going to be me. And that's when it hit me. Then I realized, it's going to be 60 years before I look like them. His father died in a car accident in the year 2000. The only person from his old life that he has contact with is his mother and the occasional letter from one of his brothers. Joshua may not be sure if he deserves a second chance, but he is still fighting to get one anyways. He feels that believing that he deserves to die in prison is a cop-out, and that it would stop him from wanting to improve and help people if he just decides to lay down and die. Thus, he and his new lawyer have been filing multiple appeals over the years to try and get a resentencing. This has garnered some traction even with some of the fiercest advocates for his original sentence had later expressed regret over his sentencing. For example, Sheriff Nat Glover stated that it was a tough sentence for someone that young, and that he never got the feeling that it was also a malicious, mean-spirited, and calculated murder. He also stated that given a different set of circumstances, it would have never happened. Harry Shorstein had regretted not offering a second-degree murder plea thus allowing for more discretion in sentencing. He has voiced his support for eventual clemency or parole option back in 2008. The Florida 2nd District Court of Appeals upheld Joshua's conviction in December of 2004. Then his mother had advocated for her son, stating that his young age should have carried more weight in his sentence in November of 2005. The Supreme Court of Florida set a hearing for the next month to decide whether he should get a new trial or not. Then in 2012, the Supreme Court of the United States decided in Miller v. Alabama that sentencing juveniles to mandatory life in prison without parole is unconstitutional, giving precedent for a new resentencing hearing. In September of 2016, that appeal was granted and his new hearing was held in June of 2017. Clifton's mother made an appearance that hearing and requested that his sentence be upheld, and it was. In December of 2019, 
the Florida First District Court of Appeals upheld the life sentence, but said it would be reviewed again in 2023. The decision will be based on demonstrated maturity and rehabilitation. He tried to appeal to the Supreme Court of Florida, but was turned down in June of 2020. Whether or not he should be given a second chance is a difficult question, one we frankly aren't equipped to answer. He wasn't malicious, that much is clear. But do his panic and age really absolve him of ending a life? Furthermore, when he found out she was still alive and had a second chance to somewhat salvage what he had done and accept responsibility for his actions, instead, he stabbed her to death and went on like nothing happened. Clearly then, he wasn't morally innocent for his actions. But can he be redeemed? Can someone do something so horrible and really ever call themselves rehabilitated? Even if released, even if he lives the rest of his life as a saint, that will never bring her back. Does that mean he shouldn't try to be better at all? These philosophical questions truly have no easy solution, and the 2023 Florida Court of Appeals has some difficult questions of morality and justice to contend with.